Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. This is episode 57. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Suzama, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. What's up, Doc? <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it. It's a bright, gorgeous day. I just had to do it. <laughs> yeah. Next time, maybe I'll have a carrot with me and do my bugs impression. Oh, it's a must. <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I'm Dr. Glenn Wallman. I will be your medical guide along with Christina today as we travel through another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy, each week searching for ways to achieve optimal health. Today's going to be fun. Uh, I have usually when I come up with a guest speaker, it's because I either know them or I've gone to them and experienced them or I've seen them in a lecture or listened to something about them. But this is very unique today. I actually had one of uh, his patients recommend him and due to HIPAA violations and because I didn't get permission, I will just say JN uh, told me about our special guest today and I'm thankful to her for that. So today we're going to meet with Dr. Hui Huang, and he is very interesting in that he represents something that we try to uh, promote here on the show all the time, integrative medicine. And let me clarify for a second. A lot of time there's confusion about uh, people when they hear the word intern or internist. Usually an intern is something that we did after medical school. We went to continue our education and we took an internship and we were interns and then we did a residency. I don't believe there are too many internships anymore. But one of the residencies and one of the specialties in medicine today is called internal medicine. And the people that practice in that specialty are called internists not to be confused with an intern in their training program. Today, we're going to be meeting with Dr. Hui Huang, who is going to tell us a great story. He is an internist, but he is also a practitioner of integrative medicine, and that his whole practice is now integrative. And we're going to meet with him and talk about many of the things that he does in his practice, which are similar and different than what many of the other internists in Western medicine practice. So I would like to introduce you, Christina, and to our global viewing audience, Dr. Hui Huang. Hello, Hui. Hello, Glenn. Hello, Dr. Wang. Thank you for joining us on the show. Uh, hello, Christina. Thank you for inviting me on the show. This is very exciting. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> when your whole practice becomes integrative, I, yeah. I'm excited to know what that, that entails. And that's what we're going to find out. We, the way that we usually do the show, as, as the medical guide, I try to set up the path that we're going to take today. So the first part will be where we try to find out some things about you and your life. What got you interested in medicine? When did you decide to become a healer? How did you go through your training? And how did you get where you are today? And then we will get more specific into how you actually practice and balance the two types of medicine, the Western internist medicine and the Eastern uh, integrative medicine. And not just Eastern, but you practice many uh, special areas, which we'll get into. Does that sound all right with you? Uh, that's, yes, that's fine. Excellent. So let's start out and just find out, give us a brief introduction of you as to where you got interested in medicine, how you be decided to become a healer, what interested you in that, et cetera? Uh, yes. Uh, if you look at my bio, um, then you will see that uh, I was born in Vietnam. Uh, I was born in 1962. I'm not hiding my age. And uh, I live uh, in Vietnam until 1976. That's one year after the fall of Saigon. So, um, during that time, uh, I read a lot, uh, uh, including Taoist books, and um, I was reading a lot of these uh, novels called martial arts novel, uh, actually from Hong Kong. And this, in this martial arts novel, there are a lot of uh, uh, Eastern thoughts. So I was familiar with many Eastern thoughts already. Now, when I got to the United States, 
um, uh, all I know is that I am good in math. And so I'm very left brain. I'm very analytical. So I went to uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, for my electrical engineering degree. Um, when uh, during my third year, uh, as a summer, doing some software, computing, or some sort of electrical engineering, I forgot, um, I discovered that I didn't really like um, engineering that much, um, partly because uh, I think that when humans create a machine, uh, when the machine breaks down, we know how to fix it. And I was able to fix uh, certain machines, certain software, certain programs. And after a while, it became boring because I like to solve problems. And it became boring when you can solve problems. Um, so I said, I want to try something different. And I decided to go to medical school. Uh, I don't know why to this day why, why I decided medical school. But I think <laughs> that humans are different than machines. So then I applied to medical school. After I graduated with a BS degree in electrical engineering, I went straight to uh, medicine. I went to University of Maryland. Uh, after that, I, I think I still didn't like medicine that much. Uh, I then applied to UCLA. Um, and uh, that was the uh, UCLA program for internal medicine. And uh, I'm going to mix and match my narrative with a letter that I sent to this lady. She's the husband of a person who founded this particular foundation, who sponsored this particular fellowship, and it's called the Kenimer Fellowship at UCLA. Um, this is, uh, the husband passed away, so we were supposed to write a letter to her uh, to thank her and the husband and the foundation for sponsoring such a fellowship. Uh, dear Mr. So-and-so, uh, I did my Kenimer Fellowship in 1991 to 1992. During that year, I rotated through different specialties, which included opportunities to teach the residents about primary care. That year changed my perspective in medicine, and therefore my career, and therefore my whole life. When I was doing my residency in a hospital, I saw the strengths of Western medicine. Some patients did not survive, but most patients were saved. During the Kenimer Fellowship year, I saw the weaknesses of Western medicine. Uh, one, it has difficulties with chronic diseases because it does not know what the causes are. Number two, it does not view the body and mind as whole. Uh, I saw that I kept adding on medication or increasing the dosages. I never took away the medication or decreased the dosages. Before entering medical school, I graduated from Massachusetts Institute of Technology with a degree of, uh, in electrical engineering, and I was used to solving problems. I was frustrated that I could not solve the chronic diseases or the mental illnesses. While walking down a hall at UCLA Hospital, I saw a course in acupuncture offer at UCLA. I took the course that was the beginning of a new perspective in medicine. When I started my private practice, I added acupuncture to the treatments. I saw the strengths and the weaknesses of acupuncture. I then studied Chinese herbal medicine, and I saw its strengths and weaknesses. I studied nutrition and saw its strengths and weaknesses. I kept studying different systems of healing, extracting what works and discarding what does not work. And the more I learn, the more successful I become at solving chronic or mental illnesses. Um, and so that's how I arrived to, um, to do what I do now, is that I, um, I don't divide medicine into really Western versus Eastern, because there are certain things that I do that neither Western nor Eastern. So, for example, um, a flu. Uh, I try many things in, um, you know, like the typical Western medicine for flu, Tamiflu, for example, I try high dose vitamin C, zinc lozenges, echinacea, golden seal, you name it. And uh, in my experience, um, if you have a flu and you take two things, one is called um, sambucol, which is an elder bear extract from Israel for the uh, virus, because it's been shown in vitro to be effective against all strains of flu viruses and colostrum, high-dose colostrum, for the immune system. And I find that if I do these two things, it's virtually 100% against any flu. 
Now, Sambuco and colostrum is neither Western medicine nor Eastern medicine. It's just natural medicine. So my principle is to use whatever works. Okay? So I don't really differentiate between Western or Eastern medicine or any type of medicine. And uh, I use different medicine for different situations. So sometimes, I, if it's an emergency, uh, I resort to Western medicine. If it's a chronic condition, then I resort to natural, whether it be Western natural or whether it be acupuncture or anything else. So that's how I uh, arrive at my uh, current integrative practice. So that's my journey so far. I think I've just found my new doctor. <laughs> I was going to say my kind of man, but <laughs> I have to change that to say my kind of doctor. <laughs> uh, and I and I think that I just changed all of the questions I was going to ask you. <laughs> so we're off into a whole new process here. Thank you for that uh, very good uh, introduction. I do, before we really get started, uh, I do want to ask you a couple of quick things. What was it like to come from Saigon and end up in Brooklyn, which is where I was born? Um, I think I always have a very uh, fluid personality. That means I can adapt to any situation. So uh, growing in Vietnam and coming here, uh, initially, I actually didn't end up in Brooklyn right away. Um, I was, uh, we, we um, let me just tell you a little bit about my escape, uh, if you don't mind. Um, so at age 14, uh, our family escaped in a boat, and the boat has 13 people. And we, uh, my father was a captain, a ship captain, and we uh, traveled to Singapore. But uh, the Singapore give us foods and all of that. My brother was six months old at that time, so they give us milk, uh, but they didn't accept us. So we went further. We went along um, Malaysia, Indonesia, and we finally landed in the Philippines on the Palawan Island. And we stayed in the Philippines about six months before I got to the United States. So when I first got to the United States, uh, I was in Maryland. Uh, and, uh, and then eventually we moved to New York because my father was ship captain and he found some job uh, at the uh, New York Harbor. Uh, when we escaped, we had $20. Uh, my father had $20 uh, with us. So that's it, $20 at that time. Um, and I think I adapted very well. Um, so I have no problem adapting to a different lifestyle. And that's just me. Uh, I'm easy, and I'm able to adapt to all situations. Uh, interesting, and thank you for that. And I would like to say that if you go to Dr. Huang's website, uh, there is a link that uh, there's a story that your father wrote about the journey and how he prepared for it and how your whole family prepared. Isn't that true? Yes, that is correct. Yeah, and it's it's a fascinating read that I would recommend uh, everybody uh, look at and read. So you're in you're in uh, your program and you're an internist. Did you ever have a practice where you were just specifically Western medicine, internal medicine? Uh, yes. So right after the uh, Kenmore Fellowship, uh, I worked at the medical group in Beverly Hills, and I practiced you know, Western medicine. Uh, but I always look for, you know, certain things because, uh, as I said, there were patients that I couldn't help and I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I start looking into, um, I mean, I start offering acupuncture and they were nice enough to let me do it. Uh, and then I start looking to uh, nutrition. Uh, but I think that it was too much for them. Uh, because I start recommending people going to certain places to get um, vitamins and minerals. And so I practiced for two years, and after the end of the two-year contract, uh, they didn't renew my contract, because most likely because they saw that you know, I'm a little bit off. And so uh, at that time, I decided to go out on my own. So I did practice Western medicine for about two years. But you were looking for that? 
uh, Taoist uh, way of of treating people, and uh, you needed something else. How how aside from just the uh, administrative type people that didn't renew your contract, how was it working with colleagues in internal medicine as you were bringing other things in? Did you find colleagues that were interested in hearing about it or some that said, oh, it's not a double blind study, so therefore it's uh, not real? Mm-hmm. What was your experience with other colleagues in the well, Western there, world? Well, there are only a few colleagues who know uh you know, what I did. And uh, it's a whole spectrum. And some colleagues were receptive and some colleagues probably, they were probably indifferent to it. Um, and, but still I was restricted to being a, um, you know, a Western practitioner. So for example, um, I had a patient with a UTI and the patient, that, I'm sorry, you, that's you a urinary, tried, you, yeah, right. urinary tract infection, a bladder infection, right? And I read about uh, d manos at that time, and but I couldn't give d manos because d mano is virtually almost 100% effective against E. coli, and but I couldn't give it. Um, and uh, I told the patient to go and get it or something like that. And, um, you know, there was a colleague who knew what I did and uh, she didn't like it, but she didn't really say anything. Um, so I got away with that case. Um, but there were other people, for example, I said to um, a few of them that most patients were magnesium deficient, and they didn't believe me. Um, so uh, I think some of them, um, I mean, just like anything in life, is a spectrum of people. Some people are more tolerant, some people are less tolerant. As you go into your practice more and more, and you're more self-sufficient now, are you finding that it's changing anywhere? Are the medical schools changing? Uh, Are the new doctors coming out more open? What's your experience there? Uh, I don't know about medical school, um, but I think uh, you know more doctors are more willing to accept. Um, You will see that there are conferences of integrative medicine, for example. Um, I think uh, at the end of April, there's a conference in Arizona where I think the topic was integrative oncology. And there are doctors from UCSF. There are doctors from Yale University. uh, And they have integrative medicine program. Uh, So we see that the UCLA has an integrative medicine program. It's called East West um, Center or something like that. Uh, Cedar sinai uh, has integrative medicine program, and I think uh, almost all medical schools now have integrative medicine program. So I think uh, it's improving. Yeah, that's a it's it's a really good sign, and I think it's really necessary because, as you say, Western medicine is superb. I worked in emergency medicine and trauma and acute diagnosis and critical care. I don't. I don't know that any other healing system uh, is better than that. But when you get to uh, chronic illnesses and maybe uh, uh, pro- preventive situations and immune system types of diseases, uh, I think that the other types of medicines seem to complement uh, well. Do you find the same thing? Yes, I agree. Excellent. So. In your practice now, you have your own practice. Tell us how you set that up and, and what's in your practice today. Um, when I get out of uh, that uh, medical group and went on my own, um, I was, um, I, I see you know, certain patients. And at that time, I must say that I did not know too much about integrative medicine. I know, uh, at that time, I knew about acupuncture, Uh, I knew uh, a little bit about nutrition, but I I had to keep studying. And one thing about this whole integrative medicine is the more you learn, the more you learn that you don't know. Uh, It's so vast that it's mind-boggling, and uh, it's like an obsession. Um, I can't stop learning, uh, (laughs) because... 
um, you know, one thing leads to another because the whole body is very complex. And you see the relationship between the different organs. Um, I remember that I remember in the, the hospital, uh, let's say you have a very ill patient with multi organ dysfunction, and you have to call the infectious disease specialist, you have to call the uh, pulmonologist. Uh, I'm sorry, these are terms for different specialists. So, dif different specialists for different organs. And sometimes they contradict one another. They write, uh, you know, orders that are contradictory with one another. And, um, you know, we don't see the body as a whole uh, as compared to, let's say, Ayurvedic medicine or especially Chinese medicine with the uh, five element. Uh, you know, you, you connect these organs together. And so uh, I find that if I want to be... Uh, a practitioner, I have to keep learning, and even each organ, it's so difficult, and uh, let alone the different connections. So, you know, you, you do the math, and you see so many combinations, relationship between uh, uh, the, the brain and the skin, the brain and the uh, endocrine system, and the endocrine system and the skin, um, in the 1970s, uh, we had, uh, I think, the start of psychoneuroimmunology, and later we add psychoneuroendocrinoimmunology, and I'm sure that you know the list would go on: um, psycho, neuro, endocrino, and hormonal, and cardio, and all, you know, the whole string. So um, it takes forever to learn about these organs, and then you have to learn about the connection between different organs. So you just have to keep learning all the time. Uh, but anyway, I think I digress about learning these things. Um, but now I see patients uh, and I see any kind of patients. Uh, let me read to you the, uh, the, the next paragraph uh, that I wrote to the, uh, the missus of the Kinemo Fellowship. Um, I have successfully used natural medicine for diseases ranging from common conditions such as coronary diseases, insulin-resistant diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, asthma, to more complex conditions such as early dementia, rheumatoid arthritis, IgA nephropathy, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, certain early-stage cancer to bad conditions such as chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome. On the other hand, I use Western medicine for urgent conditions such as acute infections, severe conditions such as severe hypertension, insulin-dependent diabetes, renal failure. Uh, and then there are diseases that I use both Western medicine and natural medicine. Finally, there are still many patients with disease that I have not been able to help. These diseases motivate me to keep on learning. So um, uh, when I see the patient, I think I might as well talk about high approach patient. Is it time yet that I do that? It's exactly time. That was my next question. Okay, all right. So let's say a patient uh, come in, and everybody, every new patient come in, I do the same type of talk. Um, and I write the um, symptoms on one side, and then I said, we want to know the causes of this problem. And then the causes are divided into external causes, external environment, and internal causes, which is the internal body. So external causes, uh, we have stress, we have infection, we have toxins, uh, we have uh, weather, we have foods, we have allergy, we have radiation, uh, ionizing as well as EMF radiation, etc. So I list the whole list of external uh, environment. And then the other side is the internal um, body, uh, which is the brain, the immune system, the hormonal system, the digestive system, you know, all the system. And in the middle of that is genetics. So we have these uh, environmental stressors interact with the body. And my job is to figure out which uh, external environment stressors interact with which organ. Uh, as you can see, there's so many external stressors and there's so many different organs. 
So when you do when you do the math, uh, the combination are almost endless, and the the trick and the fun and the frustration is to figure out what stressor interact with which organ to cause which symptom. Okay, so if uh, if a patient has a very simple problem, then it would be easier. Usually, there's only one or two uh, external stressor interact with maybe one or two organs to cause a particular symptom. But then there are patients with uh, complicated long list of symptoms. Uh, my record is a patient who came in with about three pages of symptom, and each page is a single line, you know, single line, and it's about, what, 25 lines per page? So yeah. approximately 75 um, symptoms. And if that patient were to bring in three pages of, you know, complaints to a regular doctor or brought it to me 20 years ago when I was doing Western medicine, I would be overwhelmed and probably reach for a psychiatric medication or refer to a psychiatrist or something like that. <laughs> But now I patiently try to go through and figure out which is the most important one, which one to prioritize, I mean, which problem to prioritize, which um, environment, which uh, organs I need to take care of first, and then, uh, and then just peel off the layers one by one. Uh, and so that's how I uh, approach, um, you know, any condition at this point. When that's that's amazing, and uh, I know Christina is chomping at the bit to ask you questions, but I have one or two more questions that I. <laughs> but, I'm not... <laughs> but it's all about me. It is all about me. Okay. <laughs> teasing. You know, because it is all about you, I'm going to defer and and uh, ask a question, Christina. Uh, oh my goodness! I, I, the list goes on. You think you seventy five symptoms? <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's really fascinating. I, I, I have to say, it, this is very exciting for me. It's it's really exciting for me to hear um, your passion behind what you do, uh, your driving force. Um, um, I, I love the way that you, you come from the background of science and now you're immersed in the science of the human body <laughs> and the balance. And to hear you speak of Ayurvedic medicine and and uh, the five elements in Chinese medicine, wow, it's such a, wow, I, I'd love to be your student. <laughs> but I still have a long way to go because at this point, uh, I am i don't know of a practitioner who can fluidly go back and forth between different systems of medicine. Uh, I have read, um, I, I'm not bragging about my reading, but I've read thousands and thousands of books and I have not seen the integration of all different systems of medicine. Mm. Uh, and so that would be my goal, to be able to go back and forth between different systems of medicine scientifically. Mm. Mm. Oh, exciting. Did you read the uh, Yellow Emperor's classic? Uh, uh, yes. Um, now, if we talk about Chinese medicine, um, if we stay with just strict Chinese concept, uh, then that would be fine. But if we were to explain that to a Western doctor, so the Western doctor can understand, that's much more difficult. Um, for example, um, you know, when Chinese talked about liver five, what does that mean? Uh, when Chinese medicine talked about kidney yang, what does that mean? A kidney yin deficiency, what does that mean? Uh, it's very difficult. Um, I recently read a book by this doctor. I think she's from UCSF. Um, and she wrote a book trying to do that. Uh, and so, for example, liver fire or maybe liver yang rising would be the sympathetic nervous system, for example. Okay? So it's very tricky because there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between the, uh, uh, the Chinese medicine concept versus the Western concept. So it's not a clear-cut thing. So it takes a, so it's going to take an effort of many, many people to be able to integrate uh, and go back and forth between different systems. Do you think that's going to be a century from now or closer? Uh, I think it's going to be closer. Okay. When you, when you were in medical school, one of the first things that you probably learned how to do when you got to the floor 
was to take the pulse of a patient. So I'm wondering, when you take a pulse now, do you do you shift between uh, an Eastern uh, pulse diagnosis and a Western pulse diagnosis? Uh, yes, and that's and it's still the shift is still very. I would say the word primitive, for example, uh, in a sense that when I shift from Western to Eastern medicine, uh, mostly I have to shift shift completely. Uh, meaning, occasionally I see the the connection, uh, but I can't go a hundred percent yet, uh, and I'm not even sure if it's possible to do a hundred percent shifting uh, like that. Um, so there are certain concepts in Chinese medicine that has no corresponding uh, concept in Western medicine, so you just can't shift it like that. Uh, so I think that um, the I think the Chinese uh, medicine people are trying to do some of that. Uh, I think they invented some sort of pulse reading diagnosis uh, years ago, and I tried to find it, but I couldn't find it. Um, I'm not sure if there is a true one-to-one -one corresponding, so I shift, but I still don't feel comfortable with all the concept yet. When you... Uh, when you see a patient and when you learned Western medicine, our, our natural step after taking a history and physical was start to think about laboratory tests and imaging studies that we wanted to do. Uh, and we would order blood tests and urine tests and different types of tests. And I'm sure, or I'm guessing, that you still do that. But when you have that connection, how do you verify some of the other areas that you're looking at, the connections that you talk about, uh, do you do special kind of tests? Do you have any equipment that you use to test different than uh, our other colleagues? Um, yes, I still do my, you know, Western medicine testing uh, because I think Western medicine testing is very exact. Um, when you're able to detect a problem, I mean, there are patients who have a complaint that Western medicine cannot find. Those are functional conditions, uh, such as, let's say, irritable syndrome. I mean, there's no particular test for irritable syndrome, for example. Um, but, you know, when I see a patient, I go through my Western history. I go through my Chinese um, medicine history. Uh, and then I, I do my Western medicine exam. I do my Chinese medicine exam. Uh, and I do the muscle testing. Um, you know, muscle testing is not a whole subject. Uh, but anyway, I combine all of them together, and then uh, that will lead me to doing certain Western medicine testing. So I do the regular me Western medicine testing, and then the um, so-called alternative testing, for example, the typical ones that most um, alternative natural doctors do, such as, uh, you know, stool testing, and uh, heavy metal testing, uh, environment pollutant testing, um, liver desulfication testing. So I still do some of that saliva cortisol testing. So those are the, the basic uh, tests that most um, natural doctors do. Um, and then I combine everything together for, a, uh, for the diagnosis. Now, what about in some cases, like we, we've interviewed quite a few people um, that have come on to talk about Lyme disease and how the testing in the medical world is not accurate, so to say. Yeah, Lyme disease is a whole category by itself. Um, as far as I know, there are at least eight or nine different tests out there. Um, and uh, one time I had a patient who had enough money to do all eight or nine different tests. And uh, four tests came back positive, four tests came back negative. Now, each lab will claim that there's the best. Um, so I don't know if there's a gold standard test for Lyme condition. And I know that a lot of Lyme doctors would disagree with me. A lot of Lyme patients would disagree with me. 
But that, my opinion is that this time, I don't know of a gold standard test unless you're able to see the lime in the blood, uh, you know, with the, with the uh, actual, uh, you know, microscope, uh, or you have a PCR positive testing, um, uh, but, or antigen positive testing. Uh, but other than that, Lyme disease is a very difficult disease. To, I mean, chronic Lyme disease, uh, let's clarify that. Chronic Lyme disease is a very difficult diagnosis uh, to, to, to diagnose. How about uh, treatment? Uh, treatment is also very, uh, you're talking about Lyme disease, right? Yeah, in this particular case, we could stay on that for a moment. That would be interesting, yeah. I believe. Okay. Uh, treatment is also controversial. Uh, there's a book, um, I think, called 13 Literate Lyme Doctors, talking about treatment or something like that. And so the total of 13. And if I remember correctly, something like five doctors use antibiotics, long-term antibiotics, and five doctors said not to use antibiotics and use natural stuff. And then the 11th one or the 12th uh, doctor say uh, neither and the antibiotics nor herbs work um, and do, you know, the my way. And then the 13th one say, oh, don't do any of those. Um, come to my clinic for this special treatment or something like that. So uh, same thing. There's really no gold standard treatment in the, um, chronic Lyme disease that I know of. When you are seeing so when you talked to us at the beginning and you talked about the different uh, different specialties of tra traditional Asian medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, homeopathy, you alluded to the fact that there were good points and bad points, or let's not say bad points, but points that were not as positive in each of those. I wonder, since we have someone like you to give us an opportunity, most of the time if we were talking about acupuncture, we'd be talking to an acupuncturist or to an Ayurvedic doctor uh, or a homeopath, etc. In your position, could you give us, just as we go through maybe a few of those, something positive and something that doesn't work necessarily as well that you see in each of those so let's take acupuncture first. Just uh, yes, uh, I think acupuncture is wonderful for a lot of acute diseases, um, you know, especially for pain. Now, um, as far as chronic disease is concerned, um, I think the problem—well, not the problem, but the, the weaknesses, so to speak—of the acupuncture is a lot of patients have low energy and. Uh, uh, my personal opinion is that acupuncture does not add energy. Acupuncture balance out the, uh, balances out the energies instead. So if you have uh, high energy in one particular side and low energy in one side, you balance it out. But, but overall, if the patient is low in energy, you can't add energy uh, through acupuncture, except uh, if you do electrical acupuncture, for example. So you add energy through electricity. If you do laser acupuncture, then you add energy through laser, or, uh, or let's say if you practice qigong or any form of energy medicine, then you can add energy uh, to the acupuncture. But if you just talk about just, in, uh, just acupuncture itself, it doesn't add energy. So initially, when I was practicing acupuncture at um, the, the the group uh, in, in Beverly Hills that I was practicing Western medicine, uh, because I was limited, I you know I just do plain acupuncture, and I saw that um, you know when patients have low energy, usually I can't uh, have a good result. So that's how I learned. Um, that there are limitation to acupuncture, for example. Um, or let's say, you know, you have severe diseases, then the acupuncture would be uh, limited. And, well, that's when you get to using Western medicine, when it's, you're talking about severe or acute diseases. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, did you want to say something else about that? Um, no, I, I think that's okay. just one, one, one example, yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. And and to be fair, I know that if we gave you five hours, you would be able to fill 
out with a lot more information, but you're being so kind as to just give me and our audience uh, a quick glimpse. So let's move to Ayurvedic medicine. Uh, I think I'm going to lump Ayurvedic medicine and uh, Chinese medicine together uh, in a sense that it's um, the, b- beside, b- beside the part that you know, Western medicine is good with uh, two diseases, where do you know that? Um, Ayurvedic medicine or Chinese medicine, some of the concept, um, I'm still not sure in terms of the accuracy. So, you know, in Ayurvedic medicine, you have the, um, you know, the three, three doshas and all of that. And um, I, th- I think that if you have a superb Ayurvedic physician, and I think um, you would be able to, through the pulses, and through the, um, the the different examination, you would be able to come up with very sophisticated diagnosis and sophisticated herbs to treat. Um, in this eight days and age with chronic diseases, such as we mentioned Lyme, or chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, fibromyalgia, um, I, I, I think that we still don't have enough understanding of these diseases through uh, Ayurvedic diagnosis or Chinese medicine diagnosis. However, I think that may not be a fair statement because these diseases are hard to treat no matter what system you use. I mean, Western medicine doesn't have a very good uh, reputation for chronic fatigue syndrome because they don't have any drugs to increase your energy. Uh, they only have drugs uh, for symptom, but there's no drug to increase the energy. In fact, most drugs decrease your energy because it adds you know, toxin to your system and your liver has to spend energy to detoxify. Um, so I think these diseases are very difficult to treat, uh, regardless whether it's Ayurvedic medicine or Chinese medicine. So maybe that's not a fair uh, statement about Ayurvedic medicine. Um, Another thing about the Chinese medicine is that these, the scientific principle behind it is hard to grasp. Uh, as I said, the question is how do you uh, define uh, the doshas, the vata and the pitta and the kapha and all of that? Is there a, a, a equivalent concept in Western medicine? Um, right now, I have a preliminary concept um, I can share with you, but I don't know how accurate that is. Uh, Please share was, it. That, that'll be sure. interesting, I think. Please uh, share it with us. I was thinking of um, uh, an arrow, and kapha is the base of the arrow. Pitta is the, 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 the bow itself, and vata is the tip of the arrow. So the vata is constantly moving, so it's the movement factor the body of the arrow uh, would be the transformation factor, that would be a pitta, and the kapha would be the stability factor. Um, and that's how I think of, um, if you go from one place to another, you need all three things in different proportions. Uh, so the vata is the one that moves the most, and then after that would be the pitta, and the kapha would be the, the root of them uh, that is most stable. Um, or let's say if you think of an atom, uh, my guess is that the electron would be the vata and the uh, neutron would be the pitta and the proton would be the kapha, for example. Um, and I'm working out some, some concept like that, uh, but it's very preliminary right now. Uh, I have a friend who is Indian and I'm discussing with him about Ayurvedic medicine and Yunani medicine and all of that. And so uh, when I'm more comfortable, I'll tell you. Uh, but for right now, that's my understanding. Uh, but I don't know how to translate that into Western science stuff. Um, we will have to have you back uh, and we'll keep checking in on those theories, even if they're completely wrong. Right. Which, which I don't know that they are. They're fascinating and great metaphors to be able to develop a working concept to at least have dialogue. Right. 
Uh, what about some of the other areas that you work? Are you in homeopathy also? Um, I do very little homeopathy because I think homeopathy is very difficult to be good at. Uh, you have different kinds of homeopathy. You have the original constitutional homeopathy in which you spend, you know, one, two, three hours to, you know, get everything you can and come up with one single remedy. I think in Hanuman's day, I think that's doable. Right now, with patient who hands you a list of some five symptoms, uh, it's going to take a lot of time to go through to come up with one single remedy. Um, so I think a lot of practitioners turn into complex homeopathy. They go by symptoms, but I don't think that works either. Uh, I like the concept of um, layer medicine. So let's say you have a patient with 75 different uh, symptoms, and um, you use your left brain, right brain, whatever, to come up with what is the outermost um, symptom that you have to work with. So let's say you have 75 and you divide that 75 into, let's say, six separate layers. And let's say the 10 symptoms are on the outer layers, the next five is in the second layer, you know, deeper and all of that you divide. And then when you look at those, um, at the, the outermost layers, then you would find the remedy for that layers, peel off that layer and go into the next layer. So that is a uh, somewhat of a compromise between constitutional and uh, complex homeopathy. Um, do you mean that? Do you mean that you would treat the one layer until you peeled that away and then expose the next, or are you treating all of them? Um, I think it's much easier to treat one layer at a time. Hmm. Uh, when you have patients who have some five symptom and you treat them, and if you make a mistake. And all, I mean, the patient can have a symptom number one going up, symptom number five going down, or develop different symptoms. It's actually very difficult to uh, to sort out which is which. So that's my philosophy of treating certain symptoms at a time. That's just my philosophy. Uh, if there is a miracle homeopathy worker out there who look at those five symptoms and come up with a single remedy and successful, I'll call that patient and become a student. I mean, I'll call that, that <laughs> practitioner and become the first student of that practitioner. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, what, what do you think about, uh, now there's a, a, also another area that's come up that we recently learned about, which is uh, environmental medicine. Um, environmental medicine, I think it's part of the whole integrative medicine. I mentioned before about the external environment. Uh, when you say environment medicine, uh, you mean the chemicals and the toxin, right? Yes, yes. I, I hear that people are starting to specialize in that field because it's uh, so vast now. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. I mean, each uh, each sub, each specialty is vast. Yes. Um, and so when you talk about chemicals and toxin, uh, I divide toxin into different types. Uh, one is heavy metals. Uh, heavy metals are elemental, you know, on the periodic table, uh, aluminum, lead, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, all of that. And then the other one are chemicals, and chemicals are complex molecules that are broken down through liver, phase one, phase two, phase three, and all of that. Uh, and so you treat them separately. Uh, we have uh, approximately 100,000 chemicals, so the list is endless. Um, uh, and so I think uh, environmental medicine is developing rapidly. Uh, even in um, Western medicine, I think is developing. Uh, it's just that in Western medicine, they know mostly about the acute toxic effect. They don't know about the chronic effects, and also they don't know about the cumulative effects because uh, you know uh, lead alone uh, cause you know, a certain problem, and then mercury alone cause a certain problem, but if you add them together, they cause more than just lead and mercury. They cause a whole bunch of other problems. And so we have cumulative synergistic effects between the different toxins. Um, and uh, environmental medicine is a very difficult, especially in the patient with so-called chemical sensitivity. Um, I think one of the questions that I know you're going to ask me is the frustration uh, and 
think the patient with chemical sensitivity are the most difficult because they react to the things that you think uh, you know will help them. So they can react to almost anything, including uh, homeopathic uh, products, which is supposedly just molecules, which is inflammation. Um, now, interestingly, I think environmental medicine um, invites the dialogue between the body and the mind, because a lot of chemical sensitivity also have anxiety. And so the question is, which ones come first, uh, the mind or the body or both? Uh, just today, uh, I had a patient uh, who came in um, a year ago with, uh, you know, candida symptoms and yeast and all that, and I fixed that. Uh, I get her the mercury, and she was able to eat uh, bread and cakes and pizza again, even though she she knows not to eat those too much. So we fixed that, but then more uh, toxin came out. After I get rid of the mercury... Uh, another wave of um, heavy metals came out, uh, which was uh, lead. And so I detoxified the lead, and then the thorium came out, and so I had to detoxify the thorium. Uh, and then after that, she was exposed to mold, and then after that, she became allergic to almost everything. Uh, she's allergic to cell phone, she uh, was allergic to the chemical that she used to clean the cell phone, uh, everything. And um, I have seen patients with mold before, uh, and I've treated them before, um, but she had the added problem of chemical sensitivity. And so the, and it was tearing the family apart. And because they changed house so many times, and she's allergic to this and that, and she, they had to throw away stuff. And today I saw the, um, the, the patient and the husband together, and I did some muscle testing. Uh, I won't go into the dynamics of muscle testing, uh, but when I muscle test her, an interesting thing happened. Uh, I test her whether she reacted to the mold or the chemical, or was it anxiety? And she believed that it was either mold or chemical. She did not believe that it was anxiety. And so I must have tested her, and her must have testing revealed that it was not mold, it was not chemical, but it was the anxiety to, uh, that gave her the allergic reaction. And she breathed, uh, breathed a sigh of relief, and oh. she almost cried. Because uh, all along she believed firmly that it was the chemical and the mold that caused the problem. Uh, but in her case, um, I, according to the muscle testing, it was the anxiety that caused the problem. Now, having said that, uh, I don't make judgment on the patient. Oh, it's just anxiety. You know, don't worry about it. Uh, it just shows you the profound effects of the mind on the body. And so the mind is a you know powerful um, entity and it has profound effect upon the immune system. Um, when I tested her for antibodies to mold, her antibodies were very high. So the question is, did her mind cause her body, her immune system to react like that? And uh, but one thing I know that uh, after she agreed that it was, um, anxiety that caused the reaction, um, she was so relieved and she almost cried. Uh, and uh, I think I fixed the marriage. <laughs> because <laughs> because uh, they, they were having a marriage breakdown. So it, that's true integrative medicine. Yes. But on, other, on some other patient, you can't assume it's just stress or anxiety. Uh, in some patient, it was truly mold. For example, uh, my uh, weight loss uh, program director, I have a weight loss program here, and um, he was exposed to mold before, and he lost 15% of his lung due to mold. So that was a true physical problem. That was not due to anxiety. 
So the difficult part is when a patient come in and you see them, how do you know which part is the body and how do you know which part is the mind? And that's just fascinating. It's truly fascinating. And I think that's going to be probably another specialty that's going to come out uh, in many years. You know, I gave a... I gave a talk during one of our episodes on vital signs, and we look at things like temperature and blood pressure and pulse and respirations, and we have machines that can measure these. My understanding is that combining and integrating your Western and Eastern medicine and integrated medicine plus your scientific uh, uh, background, you're working on a machine now that's going to give us another uh, definition of health and healing. Is that correct? Uh, oh, yes. Okay. Thank you for, for bringing that up for me. Okay. So, I mean, I use many machines, but right now my research is done on this particular machine. Uh, it's a bioelectrical impedance machine, so which is called that, we call that a BIA machine. And what it measures is that it measures something called phase angle, phase, P-H-A-S-E, angle. And uh, just to make it simple, understand it measure the health of the cell membrane. So I tell my patient that you are only as healthy as your cell. So therefore, um, how do I measure your health? So there are many patients we know who look healthy, but they not healthy. Or I mean, you've seen patients that supposedly healthy and gone to the doctor, and doctor say, oh, you. You are um, healthy and you're normal, and the next day the patient had a heart attack. Um, or we've seen patients with chronic fatigue where all the lab tests are normal, and you can't find anything wrong with, uh, with lab tests. Sometimes even with the alternative medicine lab tests, you can't find out what's wrong. So how do you define health? Um, we don't have a, a measurement of health yet. Um, you know, if you go to an anti-aging doctor, they have a machine uh, called the H scan where they measure many, many different things and they put together a whole profile. So, for example, you measure your brain uh, health, you measure your heart health, you measure your lung health, your skin health and all that, and you put it together. Uh, and you probably have to mathematically calculate the means or the average of all of those numbers. So we don't have a simple uh, way to measure the health of a person. And um, I use this machine to measure the face angle. Now, the way the face angle works is that, uh, as I mentioned, it measures the general health of the cell. When the cell degenerates, the face angle will go down. So let me give you a simple example. If you take a fish fresh out from, I guess, a fresh fish, and you measure the face angle, you stick two electrodes into the fish, and you measure face angle, as the fish um, deteriorates, uh, the cell disintegrate and the face angle goes down. Okay, that's a simple description of the face angle because now we deteriorate. So aging is body deterioration. Uh, and so the government uh, has done a study, NIH, it's called the NHANE study, of approximately 13,000 people, uh, uh, you know, men and women, and into different age groups. Uh, so they divide into age 10 and 20 and 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 decades like that. And you will see a graph, a curve, a pattern that uh, you start out, you know, at a certain number between age 20, uh, between 10 and 20, and then it goes up, uh, maxes out between 20 and 30, and it starts to go down each decade. And this is the reason why uh, between age 20 and 30 is the best prime time. And that's why you look at the super athletes, the Olympics athletes, their peak age is between 20 and 30. After 30, your body starts to go down. And um, a lot of uh, doctors, uh, a nutritional doctor uses as a measurement of nutrition, of a status nutrition. Um, now, there are doctors, cancer doctors, who use it uh, for prognosis. So, for example, if you have a cancer and, uh, you know, some patient would ask a doctor how many months I have to live and a doctor come up with a number. And I bet you that most number are just on the top of the doctor's head. Um, the doctor is not a psychic. The doctor cannot know 
uh, how many months the patient uh, can live. And so if you do some sort of pronouncement, uh, like a death sentence, um, that uh, has a negative effect upon the patient. But if you do want to know scientifically, they have done studies, uh, you can go on my website and you go uh, on to, uh, I guess you can search for face angle. I have studies on there uh, in which they've done study uh, a certain of the face angle and a certain threshold. If you below a certain threshold, you got so many months. And if you above the threshold, you got so many months. Uh, and they've done those study with colon cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, lung cancer, etc. So it has um, a lot of scientific uh, studies behind it. Now, the way I use it, I stumble upon um, the, a different way to use it. Uh, I'm sorry. The, another way to use it is in the weight loss uh, industry or in the athletic industry. You do a face angle on a particular patient, and as the athlete become healthier, the face angle goes up. Uh, as the overweight patient loses the uh, the fat mass, uh, the and gain the muscle mass, the face angle um, goes up as well. Uh, I stumble upon a new use of the face angle when a, uh, a staff of mine, uh, he's young, so he has a high face angle, and uh, one day I tested him and his level dropped really low. And he said that he has a migraine headache at that time. His face angle is usually about eight, which is very good for you know, between 20 and 30, and it dropped down to two, uh, and he had a migraine headache. And then the next day, um, he went back to normal. Uh, he didn't have the migraine headache uh, anymore, and then his number went up back up to normal. So I had a thought of using it to measure general health. So if you have a um, normal, let's say you have a, a baseline face angle and you have a flu, the number would drop down, and then when you get better, the number start to go up. So I had an idea of testing different supplements. So I get, I measure my baseline, and I measure multiple times to make sure that it's reproducible, because reproducibility is one of the crooks of science. Uh, and um, I test out different supplements. So I test out CoQ10, Corella. Um, you know, uh, astragalus, uh, ginseng, reishi, mushroom, you name it. I test it out to see if it increased my face angle. And most products do not increase the face angle. Some products increase about 0.1. And the most any products will increase is about 0.2. Uh, I don't have any products that will increase more than 0.2. The only thing that increased more than 0.2 would be rest and or uh, good night's sleep. A good night's sleep can increase up to 0.4 or 0.5. It depends on how low you get. So in general, you start out with a baseline, the highest number in the morning, and then it drops down, drown down, because you use up your energy, and then you eat and whatever. It depends on what you eat. If you eat good food, increase a little bit. If you don't eat the good food, it stays the same or it's lower. And then the lowest is usually at night. And then if you get night, good, good night's sleep, it goes all the way back up. Okay? All right. So it, it's, uh, it's reproducible and it's very fun to do. It takes like one minute to do. Okay. Perfect. This is fascinating. It's almost like Star Trek with uh, Dr. McCoy uh, scanning each of us. I'm looking forward to hearing more about this on a future show. Sure. We're, sp we're speaking with Dr. Hui Huang who is an internist and integrative uh, medicine practitioner. And this has been a fascinating show. And like for all of our guests, we always like to ask if you have a health tip that you would like to share with our listening audience. Uh, the health tip, uh, I just gave you the health tip, that is to rest well and sleep well. And I think that the secret of maintaining energy, and that's the secret of anti-aging. Um, uh, you may have heard of uh, people turn white hair overnight. Uh, that does happen. Uh, and so that tells you that stress can cause sleep problem, and that can cause you to age much faster. And so if you rest well, and if you sleep well, and then that will go a long way towards health. Uh, we can talk about 
how to sleep well and how to rest well later because it's a long, complicated uh, uh, subject. Uh, but for now, that's a short tip. That's a great tip, and this has been a fascinating discussion. I think we're going to, as you said, have to talk more. And I know Christina has thousands of questions <laughs> for you. I, I'm just making an so, appointment. I'm not even waiting for the right. next show. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. And uh, I'm sure that she will want to have you on Trinity of Life, as we've discussed in the past. Uh, this is great. I'm very grateful to our special guest, Dr. Hui Huang, for sharing his wisdom, expertise, and journey with us today. It's been a fascinating uh, talk. Uh, I've really enjoyed all of this, and I know a lot of people have many more questions and are looking to the future of integrative medicine. I would uh, also... Can, uh, I'm sorry, can I uh, uh, give you the last word? Um, because that will be the last paragraph that I wrote on the letter. Uh, one minute, is that okay? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Looking back, the Kenmore Fellowship experience has changed my life. I now have a thriving practice, and I'm happy to say that I'm one of those very lucky people who still look forward to seeing patients every day, and I will never retire from practicing medicine. Uh, I thank you for providing residents with opportunities to look further directions in medicine. Mm, lovely. That's beautiful. So I would also like to add a few other things. First of all, I'm grateful to uh, JN for uh, recommending me to speak with you so that we could get together. I'm also grateful for people that that uh, put up uh, fundings for people to study, and uh, they should be honored for doing that. They They offer something to our society, and that's great. I'm thankful to my teachers and to my healers, and I look forward to seeing all of you again uh, next week as we look through another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy. And then, until that time, Dr. Huang, thank you so much, and Christina, thank you for uh, being with us and allowing me to ask a lot more questions. Uh, and until next week, I wish you all optimal health. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Woman. Thank you, Christina and uh, Segovia. <laughs> thank you so <laughs> much, Dr. Wang. It's It's been such a pleasure, and I'm excited and looking forward to the next time we have you again. Um, and, of course, we would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us in this new platform of education and information. We're grateful for your continuous support and look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. We invite you to join us live on Tuesdays for Magical Medical Tour at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Time, 1.30 Eastern Time. Wednesdays for Trinity of Life at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Followed every other week with Flowing into Awareness with Anatara. You can also contact Dr. Glenn Woolman at myyogahub.com forward slash gwoolman or follow him on Twitter at Glenn Woolman. And of course, through his own website, glennwillman.com, where I do recommend you learn about his metaphor square breath. Until we meet again, namaste. Coconut water in the blender, you know, and mm -hmm. kind of sweeten it up a little bit when coconut water is some good good properties so um you know you can make a smoothie out of it if, if you do that or some people may like just drinking a savory drink i guess it just depends however it is created for a feeding tube so the viscosity and you know, it's a very smooth very thin consistency mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's like drinking a a broth yeah